It's almost here. The final season of Game of Thrones is upon us. And as it's pretty much tradition that I make at least one predictions video every year, this is the show and or movie that I've chosen. Mainly because it's the only one where I think I might actually get some stuff right. But let's add some stakes to this game. I'll definitely be doing a post end of Game of Thrones video. And for every prediction that I get wrong, I'll take a swig of this fantasy themed beverage. The best part is, if you have your own, you can play along at home. But let's be honest, all of these predictions are going to be straight up winners, because if there's one thing Game of Thrones has taught me, it's to drink and to know things. <coughs> ah, yep, I'm real good at it. <coughs> it's not good. It's vodka with red coloring. It's not good. Oh God. So, here are my 11 predictions on what's going to happen in Game of Thrones Season 8. Shall we begin? If there is one thing we know from the trailer, it's that the long-time conflict between the White Walkers and the Living is going to eventually come to a head in a great battle at Winterfell. And I expect that we're gonna say goodbye to a lot of fan favorites during that battle. It's the perfect opportunity for the writers to both raise the stakes for the audience by showing that anyone can die, while at the same time they could make their own lives easier by getting rid of characters that they just don't have the time to write for anymore. And let's be honest, I don't think that certified badass Arya Stark would be running in terror unless things were going very, very poorly during the battle. So Tormund probably saying goodbye to that glorious Ranga. Jorah, he's probably gonna go down in a blaze of glory to protect his Khaleesi. Grey Worm, well, because his relationship with Missandei is so wholesome and cute, of course the writers are gonna take that away from us. There's too many to list, but I'm pretty sure we'll lose at least five, count them, five named characters by the end of the battle. Each one more shocking and heartbreaking than the last. Prediction number two. Let's be honest, saying a bunch of characters are gonna die isn't really going out on a limb. So how's about this one? Beric Dondarrion is gonna play some kind of pivotal role during the battle, and as he does, he's gonna go out in a blaze, a literal blaze of glory. You know, like, like fire, a, a blaze. Cause his sword lights up. The reason I think that is that every time we see his character, everyone bangs on and on about how he's been brought back from the dead so many times. And he says that the reason he is, is that the Lord of Light has some kind of purpose for him. And so after eight seasons of buildup, it's probably time to put up or shut up. Though at this point, the most Game of Thrones thing the show could possibly do is to build him up as this important character and then ingloriously cut his head off early in the battle. Prediction the third. I know who Azor Ahai is. It's Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, rightful Queen of the Andals and the First Men, protector of the Seven Kingdoms, the Mother of Dragons, the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, the Unburnt, the Breaker of Chains. And now, Azor Ahai. If you're unfamiliar, Azor Ahai is the prophesied prince that was promised. You know, the one Melisandre always bangs on about. Sometimes literally bangs on about. Anyway, he's a prophesied savior of humanity who will eventually defeat the White Walkers and the Night King. And a bunch of people out there on the internet have a lot of really well-researched, super deep theories on why it could be a whole bunch of the characters we know and love. But I'll tell you why it's her. The reason is that for the first seven seasons of the show, everyone referred to Azor Ahai as the prince that was promised. Then in a weirdly specific scene last season, the Red Woman and Missandei have a conversation about how old Valyrian is gender neutral. It doesn't have to be a prince. It can mean the prince or princess that was promised. And in a season that moved at the fastest pace a Game of Thrones season has ever moved, where they cut tons of fat and travel time, you wouldn't include a scene like this unless it would become relevant in the future. And why would it become relevant? Well, because Daenerys is, in fact, Azor Ahai. So, whether she teams up with Bran to take down the Night King, or she just uses one of her dragons somehow, she will ultimately be the one who ends the White Walker threat. Four, 
But then, very shortly after finishing off the White Walkers, Daenerys is shot by a bolt or an arrow and is killed. Now, you might think that's an oddly specific way for me to predict a character dying. And... Yes. In several of the scenes last season, Daenerys is repeatedly told by her advisors that she can't just brazenly walk around the Seven Kingdoms or fly around on her dragons because it makes her a target. Anyone with a bow or a crossbow can take her out easily. All it takes is one good shot and her reign comes crashing down. Like with the previous scene about Azora High, as a writer you would only ever include a moment like this and then have Daenerys ignore it if it were going to become relevant in the future. There's a setup, the warning about getting shot, her decision to ignore that warning, and then eventually the payoff, or the consequences, for her ignoring that warning. So maybe it's a bit bold to assume that it will outright kill her, but I guarantee you that at some point this season, someone is going to shoot her with an arrow and she's going to be mortally wounded. Five. And the person who's gonna shoot that arrow, or crossbow bolt, is Samwell Tarly. No, not my Sam. Okay, okay, bear with me here. At the end of the last season, Sam still does not know that Daenerys burned his brother and father alive. And so you can bet that when he finds out that his BFF's girlfriend roasted his family, he ain't gonna be too happy about it. And sure, he didn't get along with them, but he still loved them. They were still his family. And not to mention that because of the vows of the Night's Watch, Sam has relinquished his claim as a Tarly. So by killing his father and his brother, Daenerys ended his family line. So who knows what that means for his mom and his sister, who he does dearly love and who he has a positive relationship with. By now, they've probably been kicked out of their lands, and that land has been given to some Targaryen soldiers. And so, bearing that in mind, here's a reminder about the only weapon Sam has ever really been good at using. He's gonna do it. You will. Six, the Clegane brothers will finally face off. And while this is hardly a controversial theory, in the words of one old man Luke Skywalker, it's not going to go the way you think. The odds are stacked against the Hound. After all, his big brother is now a zombie big brother, and I think he's gonna start kicking the Hound's ass. But just when you think he's gonna take out the Hound for good, from off screen in swoops Brienne, cutting off the mountain's head in one swift, powerful motion. It's a dazzling display of strength and mastery, and some Lannister soldier is probably gonna make fun of the Hound because he needed a woman to save him, and immediately after he does that, she's also gonna cut him in half. Because as a wise woman once said, who run the world? Girls. Seven, of course, except if that girl's name is Cersei. She don't run the world. In probably the final or maybe the penultimate episode of the show, Queen Cersei is gonna get Queen Slayed by the Kingslayer, Jaime Lannister. But how? How will he get to a point where he kills the woman he loves? Well, much like with the Mad King, there's probably going to be a breaking point for Jaime. Cersei's right-hand creep, Quyburn is probably gonna craft some kind of strange disease or remake a whole bunch of wildfire, and she's going to unleash it as a last resort. Just as it looks like our heroes are beating her and are finally going to win, she's going to decimate them using this weapon. And, like, tons of people are going to die here. I mean more than in the battle with the White Walkers. We're going to lose a lot of cast members. And so, in response, Jamie will do what he has to do. He couldn't stand for a mad king, and he won't stand for a mad queen, either. Eight. So, once the White Walkers are defeated and Cersei is out of the way, what kind of ending are we looking at? Who remains when the dust settles? Well, if you look at the kind of character that the show usually advocates for, it's the underdogs. The chosen princes like Robb Stark or Daenerys' brother are gotten rid of pretty early on in the series. After they're gone, we spend all of our time following the rejects. Our heroes are the ones that the society of Game of Thrones doesn't accept. Whether that's women, dwarves, bastards, or slaves, as the show has gone on, the ones the world had written off are the ones that are claiming it. And I think the end of the series will largely stick with that theme. So, John, Sansa, Arya, Brienne, Missandei, they're all going to make it. 
It won't be a bright and happy kind of make it. They will lose a lot along the way, but in the end, they will triumph. They will have broken the wheel that kept people like them down for over a thousand years, and they will rise. It's their turn to sit on the throne. Mighty Nine, so who ends up on the actual Iron Throne at the end? Well, while it might not be on the actual Iron Throne, because breaking the wheel probably means getting rid of that one, John is definitely going to be the king. From a broader narrative perspective, it just makes sense. John is the rightful king, both by blood and by marriage. So if he sits on the throne, it ties up the story in a neat little bow. Order has been restored. All the more because John hasn't and doesn't know about his bloodline yet. He's been a bastard all his life. People have treated him like a bastard. And so in the middle of next season, he's going to be hit with a massive revelation. And you don't spend eight seasons building up to that revelation unless you pay it off in a big way. But it's precisely because John went all his life not knowing about his lineage that I think it makes a lot of sense for him to end up on the throne. He never wanted power. He never wanted to be king. And a lot like Ned Stark, he's a man of honor. That is what will make him a great king. And it will bring the story full circle. Because ultimately, I don't think that the lesson of Game of Thrones is what a lot of people settled on after season one. Ned Stark's honor didn't make him dumb or weak. He was killed because the system of the Seven Kingdoms, the Wheel, empowered people who were conniving and malicious. But once the Wheel is broken, once the old system has been thrown onto the fire, that is the time to lead with justice and honor. And so by becoming king, John isn't just fulfilling his bloodline. Because really, who cares about that? What he's really fulfilling is Ned Stark's ideology, his belief in doing what's right. And that would be a pretty powerful ending. 10. Sansa will become Wardeness of the North. Of all the characters the world of Game of Thrones had written off, Sansa probably suffered the worst. She was abused for years in King's Landing, then she was sold off to the Boltons and abused some more. But ultimately she survived and she learned and she didn't let her experiences break her. She let them teach her. So much so that last season she outwitted the cleverest man in the Seven Kingdoms and his blood now sullies the floors of Winterfell Castle. Littlefinger taught her too well and it was his doom. And again, a character who had been cast aside rose to the occasion. She's the rightful heir, she's more than qualified for the job, and let's be honest, if anyone deserves a happy ending after all the trials of this story, it's Sansa Stark. 11. Well, Sansa and Arya. In a way, Arya has gone through a little less of a ringer, but she has gone through training and become the ultimate warrior slash badass assassin that she'd always wanted to be when she was a kid. The one thing even her father told her girls couldn't be. In doing so, Arya has become pretty much everyone's favorite character, and I think there would legitimately be riots if she was killed off. And so, to protect the peace, I think the writers will keep her alive. And I think Arya, of all the characters, is the one who will end the series the freest. The one who is truly broken away from the society of the Seven Kingdoms. Once Cersei is dead and the Great Wheel is broken, Arya's quest for revenge that began all the way back with Ned Stark's death will finally be over. She can finally let go, and she'll sail off into the sunset with everything she's learned over the years, all the abilities she's picked up, and she will decide her own future. Essos is east, and Westeros is west. But what's west of Westeros? What is west of Westeros? A spin-off, that's what! Guys, this whole coming month of April is going to be an emotional roller coaster for me. Between Avengers Endgame and the final season of Game of Thrones, I'm probably going to be a blubbering mess 
through to the month of May. And if you wanna hop onto this overly emotional train with me, then you should definitely check out a new video game that's come out on the Steam store, Newfound Courage. Don't click away, this isn't a sponsorship. But I do know the creator of the game, Curtis, and I know how much love and soul he's poured into this amazing indie artwork. It's fun, it's imaginative, and it's a deeply touching story. So if you're looking for a story-driven game to play, then look no further. And if you like it, let him know I sent you. Or, I mean, you don't have to. I mean, I'd, I'd appreciate, I, I'd like an ego boost once in a while, you know, but you don't have to. Please say nice things about me. Winds howling.